At this point in your career, you should have a basic understanding of the principles of orthographic projection. You should have completed some of the practice exercises in the workbook that deal with identifying surfaces in the orthographic views. But now, it's time for you to create the orthographic views. So let me give a little demonstration here of how we can turn an isometric projection into an orthographic drawing of an object. In this exercise, you'll start with an isometric view of an object and you'll translate that into orthographic views. You'll construct the front, top, and right side views. In the business of engineering drawing, it's not like horseshoes. You just can't be close and get credit. You have to be exact. You have to be very precise. And also, neatness counts. So there are some drawing habits and techniques that you should develop to produce proper engineering drawings. One of the first things we have to consider when going from the isometric view to the orthographic views is how to align or how to space these views on the paper. Now, in the real world, you'll also have to leave room for dimensions because you have to describe the size as well as the shape of objects. In this example, however, we're not going to be adding dimensions. We will be using, however, the pre-printed grid that's provided for us on these drawing forms from the workbook. In some cases, we would, you would start with a dimensioned object and you'd use your drawing scale to actually measure things. But because in this exercise, we want you to just get a little practice concentrating on making the orthographic views, you'll be using this pre-printed grid. Notice that there are two views here, but actually three spaces between the views. Ordinarily, to space these views out exactly equally, you would measure the depth of the object and the height of the object, add those two dimensions together, subtract that from the space you have to work in, divide by three, and then equally space those objects. Actually, if I want to be honest, in real life, a drafter, by the time they get a little experience, has a trained eyeball and they could eyeball these in to the proper place. Remember that they have to leave space for a lot more than just the views. They have to leave space for dimensions. But in this example, let's go ahead and use the grid dots. And this has been designed to work so that if we start on the first line of grid dots with a front view, everything will fit quite well. Well, let me get started and actually do this exercise for you or show you how to do this exercise of translating the isometric drawing to the orthographic view. The first thing I'm going to do, since I'm going to use instruments for this drawing, is I'm going to attach the drawing to the drawing board. Now, one thing you do not want to do when you tape a drawing to the table is use standard cellophane or scotch tape. The, the drafting tape is designed specifically so that it can be removed without harming the uh, drawing itself. So let me align, I'm choosing a, a line of horizontal grid dots here, lining it up carefully with the T-square, and then I'll tape the corners of the drawing down to the drawing surface. And I'll go ahead and tape all four of the corners down. And then I'll be ready to draw. Now, some people who aren't very experienced about mechanical drawing, will try to do one view from beginning to end and then add the other views. That's not the most efficient way to do it. The most efficient way is to block the views in and work the views together. In this case, we're going to start with a horizontal line that's going to represent the bottom edge of the front view, and we're going to start that on this lower row of grid dots. So let me line my pencil up with that. Now, this is a construction line. And ordinarily, if I drew a construction line on here, you would not be able to see it. Let me draw another one for the top edge. I know the height of this object, and I know the height in grid dots. It's one, two, three, four grid dots tall. And that height appears in both the front and the right side view. So let me go up one, two, three, four grid dots. And let me draw a construction line all the way across for both the front and the right side view. Now, when you do this, you should not draw your construction line as dark as I've drawn them. I've drawn them so you can see them on the TV screen. If I was doing this for myself, I would draw the construction line so light that I could only see them 
and no one else could, especially if they were an arm's length away. So I've exaggerated the, the construction line darkness here. Now, let me draw the construction lines for the width of this object in both the uh, front and the top views. And I've done a little counting of the grid dots available, and I've counted how wide this is, and decided that this will be spaced nicely if I come over here just about a grid dot in from the edge. Remember, I have to take advantage of the space available, and I'm going to draw a construction line for one side of both the front and the top views at the same time. Now, I find out that this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven grid dots wide. So I go two, four, six, seven grid dots wide. Make a little mark there so I know where to draw. And then I'll draw my construction line for both the front and the top view. Now I'm going to put two grid dots worth of space between the front and the top view, and then I'll draw construction lines for that. Let me start here. And the depth appears in the top view. So let me count one, two, three, four, five grid dots deep. One, two, three, four, five grid dots deep. And I'll draw the construction line for the upper part of the top view. Now let me block in the right side view. And I'm going to space this over about three grid dots. How do I know that? Well, I counted how many grid dots I had in the whole space, and I counted how many grid dots wide plus how many grid dots deep this object was, and then subtracted that from my overall space and divided by three and rounded it to the nearest whole grid dot. And that resulted in a spacing between the views in this example of about three grid dots. Now this is one, two, three, four, five grid dots deep, just like it was in a top view, by the way. So if I come over here, one, two, three, four, five grid dots deep, I can box in the right side view. Now whenever I'm making a three view drawing, I always start with construction lines, very light construction lines, by boxing in the three views that I'm going to draw. Then I'll start drawing construction lines for the principal features in this object. In this case, it's a fairly simple object. The principal feature appears in a front view, and it's this little L-shaped gash out of there. So let me find out where that is. Count grid dots. One, two, three grid dots across here. One, two, three grid dots across. And one, two grid dots deep. So let me just rough that in. And by the way, notice that that is not only going to appear in the front view, but it's also going to appear in the top view. So while I'm at it, I can save time by working on both top and front views at the same time. Now let me do the horizontal part of that gash. And I know that that's two grid dots down. And I can draw that line in both the front and the side views at the same time. Well now, I have the construction lines all drawn for this object. By the way, I don't know if you noticed this, it's pretty hard to see on the television screen, but the pencil that I've been using for all of my construction work is a conical point pencil that I can sharpen up very fine because ordinarily I would not make these lines very dark like I've shown them here because they have to appear on the TV. Ordinarily I'd make these construction lines very light and thin, so I use a conical point pencil for that. But once I have this laid out and I'm ready to finish the job, I'm going to switch to my uniform lead holder. And the ANSI standards for mechanical drawings call for a line thickness or a line width of 0.7 millimeters. And that's the size lead that I have in this uniform lead holder. Now, here is a drawing technique that will help you keep your drawings neat and tidy. And this is one of the reasons why we work all the views together. We don't work just one view and then go back and do the other view. What I'm going to do when I darken these lines is I'm going to work first from the top to the bottom, and I'm going to work across all the views. Now you might notice I'm going back and forth on this line just a little bit. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to get a lot of graphite down on the paper. These lines should be a little bit shiny when you've finished them. Now comes the front view and the right side view. 
And moving down a little farther, next line in the front view, and also the right side view, and the bottom edge, front view, and right side view. Now, if I was drawing on a drawing table, this is a little fakey on the television version of this, because we've had to make some adjustments to get it on your TV screen. But typically what happens when you bear down and you put nice shiny lines, little microscopic crumbles of, of graphite powder will appear. And if I start moving drawing tools across this drawing at this point without cleaning those graphite crumbles, they're going to start smudging my drawing. So at this point, before I use my triangle to darken the vertical lines, I'm going to take my dry cleaning pad. It comes in a little box like this. It looks like this. And I'm going to massage just a little bit of eraser dust on that drawing. And I'm going to very lightly clean this up and clean those little crumbs of graphite off there. And now, before I draw, because I don't want to be uh, drawing on top of eraser dust, I'm going to clean that eraser dust or the dry cleaning pad dust off of the surface of the drawing. Then I'll continue, and this time, since I'm right-handed, I'm going to darken the vertical lines going from left to right. I'll just start here on the left edge and work two views together. Working across from left to right so that as I bear down and make good, dark, shiny lines, uh, I don't work back across the line I've just drawn and smear that graphite over my drawing. Now to the side view. And notice when you use the uniform lead holder, you hold it differently than when you use the conical lead. The conical lead you hold at an angle to the uh, drawing surface and you rotate it as you draw the line to keep it sharp. But when you're finishing the drawing with a uniform lead holder, you want to use the full width of that lead. So you notice that I'm holding it perpendicular to the drawing surface and you never sharpen this kind of pencil. That's an advantage. The other advantage is that you always get nice uniform thickness lines. In the old days, before we had this kind of pencil and we had to draw everything with our conical point pencil, you had to develop a technique of very carefully revolving the pencil while you were drawing it to keep the lines as even as possible. Now you don't need to worry about that so much because you're just going to use this pencil for construction lines. Well, once again, before I work tools over this, I want to clean up any graphite powder that might have been put there by darkening in the lines. And then I'll carefully brush that off. And if I actually did the very fine construction lines that I would normally do, um, I'd be done at this point. However, because I had to make them a little darker for the television camera, uh, I'm going to clean up these construction lines and I'm going to use this handy erasing shield for that and my Magic Rub eraser. You notice there's all kinds of funny little holes in this erasing shield and it's designed so that you can use those to protect different parts of the drawing and do precision erasing. I'll just clean this off here, project, protect this front view, clean this off here, and you get the idea. Let me just finish that. I'll be back in an instant. Well, now I've gone and cleaned up those construction lines again. I would not have had to do that if I wasn't working on TV and would have made my construction lines very, very light. But even if you never make a mistake, you will be wearing out erasers doing engineering drawings, and you will be using the erasing shield. It's a very thin piece of uh, sheet metal. And when they're brand new, they can be hard to pick up from the table. Let me show you a trick. Some of your best friends won't tell you these tricks sometimes. What you do is you very carefully just bend a little bit so that when you put this down on the, the table, you can, it'll come right up and you don't have to poke your fingernail under it to try to lift it. When your drawing is all finished, your line should be very dense. Because people will only be seeing copies of your drawing, you must make these lines very dense and very uniform because otherwise they won't reproduce properly. 
to be successful in the engineering drawing business, you really have to have very well-developed three-dimensional visualization skills. And so over the years, uh, those of us in the teaching business have created a lot of different kinds of exercises to help you build those important three-dimensional visualization skills. And one kind of exercise that we've invented is called a missing line problem. And you'll see one of them here. Here you have a partially completed orthographic drawing. We have a top view and a front view and a right side view, but purposely one line has been left out of one of the views. It's your job to solve this problem. And if you like puzzles, you love this kind of stuff. And if it's a little confusing, you need a little more practice on 3D visualization. Here's the secret for how to attack these kinds of problems. The secret is to sketch out the isometric view or pictorial view of the object based on the information you have in the given views. And usually, before you're done sketching this view, you'll have solved the problem. The trick to sketching an isometric view, by the way, is to block in the height, width, and depth of a shape that's big enough to contain the object you want. And by the way, I say sketch because in this example, I am going to do this by freehand sketching. You could also do this using your drawing instruments. But with the advent of computer-aided drawing and design, sketching skills are increasingly important and instrument drawing skills are decreasing in importance. So you have the opportunity here to practice either sketching or uh, manual tool drawing. We're going to do it as sketching in this example. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch a block that's wide enough and deep enough and tall enough to make one of these objects. Then I'll start carving away at that block. So it turns out that when you see this uh, practice exercise in your engineering drawing workbook, you'll see that we've given you a head start by marking the corners of a block and giving you an isometric grid. I don't think you can see that isometric grid on the television screen. It's a little too, too faint, but it's there and you'll see it when you're actually sketching this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count grid dots, one, two, three, four, five, six, so on, so on, so and find out how wide it is and then I'll sketch. It's going to be a little awkward for me to sketch without blocking the uh, camera's view, but I'll do it. I'll sketch the width and I need to know the height of this, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I'll sketch out the height and the depth. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And then I can rough in and I, let's see, can you see that on the television? I should be doing this a little darker than normal because um, I, I have to do it dark enough for you to see it. Ordinarily, just like in uh, construction lines, I would be doing this very lightly at this phase. I'll try to bear down a little more than normal so you can actually see it. Notice that when I'm freehand sketching, I do not tape the paper down because what you'll find is that to sketch straight lines, you have a certain stroke or a certain motion that'll be easier to do and it's easier to be able to move the paper around. Well, now I have a box that's big enough to make this block. So let me look at characteristic features. Well, for example, in the front view, this whole corner of the box is taken away. So let me do that. Let me count down one, two squares. I'll count down one, two squares in the isometric and count over one, two, three squares or grid marks, three grid marks. So I'll count over one, two, three, and that'll put me there. And I'll play follow the dot. And now I know that I've taken this whole corner away. So let me do it. Let me plow all the way through the material here. Let me plow all the way through the material here. Ah. But where's that going to come out? It's going to come out directly below the original back corner. And then from that point, I can play follow the dot. Now what I can do is I can take my eraser and take that material of the original block away because I know that with that taken away, I can still make this object. The reason I know that is because that whole corner is gone in the front view. So is this one. So let me do the same thing on this side. Come down two squares, come down two squares, come in one, two, three, or grid dots, one, two, three grid dots, play follow the dot. Now, I want to, when you're sketching lines, let me tell you a trick that my old high school shop teacher Gus Mortensen taught us, and it's still good today. When you're sketching a line from one point to the other, don't focus on your pencil. 
focus your, your attention on where you're going, not where you are. And if you look at the point where you're going, your pencil will get there quite easily. So now I'm going to plow through this corner. And that shows me where to cut the back part off and take that away. So you see what I'm doing. I'm doing the easy parts first. And the, this is an easy part because when I look at the front view, I know those corners are gone. Now I can work around here and look at the side view. I know that this whole zap L-shaped thing is also in there. So that means I come up one square. I come up one square and I go back in three squares. So let me go up one, back in three, and then straight up all the way through the part and plow all that out of there. That means that this corner goes all the way across the front. So let me trace that all the way across the front. Now let me go straight up. Whoops, straight up isn't straight up here, is it? It goes around the corner up the slant since I've carved that off there. But I know that I end up two squares in from the back. So let me count over two or two grid marks in from the back. So I've got to cut right across there and from here to there. So let me sketch that out. And the same thing back here. Follow over two dots, put a mark, sketch from there to there. And now I know that from this corner, I go straight back all the way across the object. So all the way across the object. And there should be a little vertical place on this side, just like there was on the other side. And this comes out across here because remember, this steps up one corner here and all this is gone. And now this is getting a little messy, so let me clean away the stuff that I don't need. And see how we're shaping up here. Take that all that material. What I'm doing is I'm observing that in the right side view, all of this material is gone. So I've taken care of all that material, taken it right out of there. And how does that work now? Well, in the front view, it looks the same as, as my sketch pictorial. Now I see a little rectangle here, see a little rectangle here, see this funny little shape thing here, see this funny little shape thing here. All these surfaces come out straight lines in the front view. How about the top view? I've got three rectangles there, three rectangles there. I've got a big rectangle there. This whole funny shape is one line in the top view. How about the right side view? Well, wait a minute. Remember this came up a square, came up a square and went that way and there ended up being a line across the top of that L-shaped surface. And that's the missing line in the right side view. So let me just do that. Now the last step is I'm going to go and darken in my sketch. And I'm going to do that. Oops, press down so hard it broke my lead. I'm going to do that by putting some graphite right down here on the paper. And usually when I'm finishing this job, I like to do all the parallel lines at the same time so that I kind of keep them parallel. And then I'll turn the paper and do the lines in another direction so that my stroke can be uniform. And remember, this is a freehand sketch, so it doesn't need to look like it was done with a straight edge. But it does need to clearly represent the three-dimensional object in the isometric view. And a little vertical line there, a little vertical line there, a little vertical line there. And now I've got these little inclined surfaces. And remember, don't look at your pencil. Look at where you want the pencil to go. Follow Gus Mortensen's old sketching trick. Keep your eye on the goal, not on where you are. And once you're done, you have a completed top view, front view, side view. The isometric sketch has helped you identify what line was missing in the original views. And by doing these kind of exercises, you will help build your three-dimensional visualization skills. Well, once you've completed a number of missing line exercises and you've gotten a little practice visualizing 3D, it's time to take it to the next level. And the next level is to do a missing view problem. And here's an example that I'll do for you. Now remember, with uh, orthographic projection, we show two of the three dimensions in any particular view. But with two views, you have three dimensions worth of information. Once you have developed your 3D visualization skills, you should be able to look at these two views and in your mind see this object kind of spinning around any way you'd like to look at it. Well, to get to that point, you need some practice. And one way to practice is to figure out what the top view looks like, 
But to do that, we're going to use the same approach we used with the missing line problem. And that is, we're going to sketch the pictorial view. And once we've sketched the characteristic features in the pictorial view, probably the missing view will suggest itself to us. Now it's possible to do this exercise either using drawing instruments or sketching. But in either case, eventually you need to practice your sketching skills. Believe it or not, even in this day of computer technology and advanced modeling software, there are still a lot of multi-million dollar deals cut on a cocktail napkin sketch. And it's very important to, for you to develop sketching skills. And I'm going to solve this missing view problem as also as a freehand sketching exercise. The first thing I do is I block in the pictorial view with the width and the height and the depth of the object. And I have these grid marks here that I can use. You probably can't see them on TV, but you'll see them when you look at the, the problem sheet. And I can find out how wide it is. So I'll just start out here and sketch in the width of the block. And I can find out how tall it is. So I'll sketch the, the height of the block. And we also have the isometric grid uh, there to help you uh, sketch out this object in uh, the pictorial. However, eventually, as you get more experience, you should be able to wean yourself from these grids and you should be able to do this freehand and have it look almost as good. Okay, now I need to figure out the depth of the object and sketch that in. And then I'll go ahead and turn that into a 3D block. Now this isn't the final object, of course, but if I have the proper width and height and depth, I know that I can make one of these objects from this block. As a matter of fact, that reminds me of a silly story that I once heard uh, in the old-fashioned days uh, when there was a guy around by the name of Michelangelo. He was a famous sculptor. Maybe you've seen photographs or in the museum with copies of his famous statue of David, which is carved out of a big chunk of marble. And one time a newspaper reporter of the day, if they had those kind of people, went up to David supposedly, in, or I'm sorry, went up to Michelangelo and supposedly said, hey Mike, he said, how can you take that ugly block of rock and carve on it and come up with this beautiful statue of David? And the response was, well, what you do is you take the big chunk of rock and you just take away everything that does not look like David. Well, you can use that same Michelangelo approach when you're sketching these three-dimensional objects. I've made a block of stuff on paper that's big enough to carve out one of these shapes. Now all I have to do is take everything away from this that doesn't look like this thing. And if I look at the front view, I can see this little char characteristic V and rectangular shaped groove in here. So let me start carving that away on the front face of my block. This comes over here one grid mark, so I come over here one grid mark, make a little reference point, and then this slanty thing comes over two and down one, so I'll come over two and down one, and then I'll play follow the dot. Same thing on the other side, I'll come over one dot, and I'll come over two and down one, and I'll play follow the dot. And there's no line across the middle there, but from those points, it goes straight down. And as a matter of fact, it goes straight down one, two, grid dots, so I'll go straight down two grid dots, and come straight across. Now, since there's nothing but air in this whole area, I can plow all of that out of there. Let me plow it out of here in my sketch by just taking, although we'll get the lead out a little bit, just taking and running this clear across from that corner to the other side of the block, from this corner to the other side of the block, and by the way, if I count the dots, one, two, three, four, five, I know that this has got to go five dots deep, one, two, three, four, five, which quits a little early, and then I can fill that in. Same thing on this side, and then I can fill this in, and don't forget the bottom corner, oops, disappears right behind there. Now let me take out that top stuff, because this top stuff is gone, I'll take it out of the pictorial. And when I do that,